pictures he uh, encountered trying to track down uh, photos and uh, people that uh, were uh, involved with him during the Korean War. Uh, and he's, uh, I think as, the way I heard it, he had essentially put this together for his family, but uh, Mike Fellows was uh, able to convince him to come and share it with the rest of us. Mike is a neighbor of uh, Mike. Mike and Mike uh, are neighbors Mike's. up in uh, Gun Barrel? Gun Barrel. Gun Barrel, up in uh, Bolden. Okay, anybody else? Anything else? I think I'm good. I'm gonna get out of the way. Uh, Michael, you got your... Uh, you yeah, I'm gonna make sure it's on. on there. Does it sound like it's no, on? No, I don't have to turn anything on. Because the I'm green light on. is on. <laughs> it is, okay. So it is We're all set? Yeah, we're all set. Well, thanks, Gary. And I'm Mike Maurice. I live in uh, Gun Barrel, as Gary said. And um, so I bumped into Mike, uh, well, about a couple years ago, and I told him I'm, I'm creating a book about my dad who was in the second battle of Pork Chop Hill. And uh, I said, I'm not completed yet with the book, but however, when I complete, I'll, uh, I'll get in touch with you. So I, I got in touch with Mike recently, and I said, I'm, you know, I had the book done for a while now. Uh, the book was originally designed from family consumption, not for the general public. However, I've changed this presentation around a bit to show what it takes to get a picture book up. So if any of you are interested in creating a picture book, this should give you ideas about it. Um, one thing I want to specify, I'm not a veteran. However, I was exposed to um, and a proud son of my dad uh, for many years. <clears throat> so this is him, um, Richard G. Maurice. Uh, like I said, he's involved in Pork Chop Hill. Um, this particular picture was taken in, uh, he was on R&R &R in Japan. And um, one of the, the other reasons why I created this book is because my dad's brother was in um, Korean, the Korean War, just before my dad went over. And my uncle went over in 1951 and served to 1953. My dad went over in 52 and served to 54. So um, what happened was, you know, it typically happens if you're, you know, have brothers or whatever in the service. It was like two ships passing in the night. When my uncle was coming back from Korea, my dad was going over. So the two brothers didn't see each other for over three years, if you picture that. Uh, because once he was over in Korea, he didn't come back to the States at all. A little bit of R&R &R and so forth, but that's about it. So I'm going to proceed ahead. One thing I want to uh, mention is that my cousin, who is uh, my Uncle Bob's daughter, did a book before me. So that's inspired me to use Shutterfly. If you want to get into this, there's a software program called Shutterfly Online where you can just, you know, you scan your pictures in and you bring, this is a term to be a picture book, not like a, you know, written book. You scan your pictures in and in the captions you can put whatever you think, you know, uh, just to specify what the picture's about. The other thing Shutterfly does, it gives you themes. This is the military theme, that's why I see all the stars there. So obviously a beautiful format to create a, a nice book. So let's go on to the next slide now. One thing I wanna do is I'm going outside the book. This is part of the book, this is the book cover here. But I wanna introduce up front a couple gentlemen I got in touch with, they're very important for this presentation. So here's one here. Now how did I find this gentleman, John Phillips? Well, John's still alive. He lives down in Pensacola, Florida. And uh, if you notice up top, he's in the same um, Howe Company as my dad. 17th Regiment, 2nd Battalion, Howe Company. Now, how big are companies? So some of the guys that have been in the Army before, I'm guessing 150 to 200 people in a company. And this gentleman happened to be still alive. I contacted him. I found him through the internet. And um, when I contacted him, it was through his church. He's a reverend down in Pensacola right now. He gave me a call and we started a dialogue. This happened about two years ago after the book was completed. So he was in um, the same company as my dad, but he was in the mortar platoon. My dad was in the machine gun platoon. And um, the other thing is that recently, John sent me a bunch of information. He had um, letters sent to my dad's commander, uh, who was a machine gun platoon leader, that took my, my dad up the pork chop. Now imagine this, I find out that this gentleman here has dialogue written in the 1990s about um, uh, all the experiences that my, my dad's commander, Raymond Clark, who was the machine gun platoon leader, it led my dad up there. I have all that dialogue, so I have this, Raymond Clark's notes on my dad's trek to Pork Chop Hill, if you can imagine. You won't find this in any book. 
The closest thing you'll find it is a book called On Hollowed Ground. I'm not sure if, if any of you read that book. Anyway, um, the other thing that John told me is down the bottom here. He says, by the way, Mike, you might want to, of course, this was taken in Korea here, and this is taken about five years ago of John. But down the bottom, he says, I recommend you read a book called Battle on the 38th Parallel, written by Joe Gonzalez. So I say, okay, I'll, I'll get the book. So I bought the book, and guess what? Oh, well, <laughs> I'm on the wrong side. This is just some of the extra slides that uh, John Phillips sent me. These are 35 millimeter that he transferred over to digital format. I thought these were fabulous because they're crisp and clear. So they're digging out bunkers and so forth. Um, this is a picture of First Lieutenant Robert Smith, who was the commanding officer of Howell Company. Um, so he was a step above, you know, two steps above um, my dad. So anyway, this is him digging bunkers and so forth. I mean, you're not going to find, there are some pictures like this on the internet, not much though. So remember I just told you that J uh, John told me to um, read this book here, Battle at the 38th Parallel. That's the cover of the book. So my wife and I, who's uh, Jay right here, we went over, we took our, our bikes over to Niwat for a veterans event. And downtown I see this guy across from me and he has a Korean War hat on. So I have to go over and talk to him, right? That's him right there taking it. And I, I started talking to him. He said, uh, my dad was on Pork Chop Hill. He goes, I was up on Pork Chop, but not during the same battle. But um, so anyway, I bump into this gentleman. He's still alive. I tried to get him here today, but I wasn't able to get in touch with him. And um, it was like one out of a million chance I met him because he just happened to live in the next town over from me, and I just bumped into him. So I thought that was something else. And he served in the Army 1952 to 68. So as you can see, that range, time range, that's Korean War and also Vietnam War. And I'll go a little bit more into this. These are pictures that, um, of Joe Gonzalez that wrote that book. That's him on the left. That's on the back of his book. Uh, and also, he had this at his house when I went to visit him um, of some tents set up in Korea, 1952. And then this is Vietnam. He was a CH-46 C Knight uh, pilot. So he was the co-pilot on a CH-46, so right seater, not the left seat. And uh, this picture on the left was taken in 1968. The other thing uh, that Joe is involved with, he worked for Boeing over 35 years. I think that's why he was invited, you know, he, he wanted to keep in the Army and so forth, but he was, um, because he was Boeing, he got checked out as a, a pilot and so forth and started flying helicopters there. The next picture will show something that Joe went through in Vietnam. Now this is uh, n July 15, 1966. Joe's CH-46 was hit by AAA and crashed. So according to Joe, because um, he was co-pilot, the, the pilot was hit by AAA in the back, and there's, there's two major rotors there. He tried to keep, you can see the smoke coming out the front. He tried to keep the helicopter with forward momentum to get the smoke out of the cockpit, otherwise you won't be able to see. So he did that, that crash landed. Unfortunately, there were some people killed. Um, Joe. The only reason I bring this up because Joe brings it up. If I if he didn't bring it up, I wouldn't bring this up. But it was you know it was something that uh, it was um, a bad scene. Anyway, um, Joe when he worked at Boeing, he also contributed to many publications. On the left there, um, a lot of these are helicopter related. So he has got the fly-by wire uh, backup demonstration. This is 1976. Fly-by wire was in its infancy, right? And then on the right side, emergency power benefits to multi-engine helicopters. Well, that's if you, you lose an engine. That helicopter has two engines, right? If you lose an engine, you want to make um, sure that your, your primary engine still running is providing maximum thrust. So that's what a lot of these um, uh, publications are about. So he can, I just want to show you an example how he contributed to Boeing. Now, the third person in touch with Bill McWilliams. This is interesting how I got in touch with Bill. I read this book and I was so impressed on Hollow Ground. I recommend it to anybody in here who wants to read about the Second Battle of Pork Chop Hill. It was fantastic. I don't, he did these interviews back in uh, late 90s and early 2000s. So there you can see a rifle squad set up. Um, I'm not sure what hill they're on. But the way I found out, I, I spoke with this gentleman, his, he was living in Las Vegas according to the internet. So when I typed in his name, oh, he's living in Las Vegas. No telephone number, I got his address. I wrote him a letter, 
and I said, I'd like to talk to you, and you know, can you give me a call? What about a month later, he calls me, he moved to Utah, and he calls me from uh, Utah, so I had a good hour discussion with him. Some of the highlights on Bill, because I was impacted by reading his book, are it provided a lot of detail on the second battle of, of Port Chap Hill. Now, Mike Fellows showed me your library here. You only have about this many books in the library regarding the totality of Korean War. So everything else is a massive amount of documentation you have on uh, World War I, World War II, Vietnam War. But Korean War is definitely lacking, the forgotten war, right? Um, so like I said, Bill called me up about a month later and I had a big you know, discussion with him and he talked about the book. And Ken Burns, who did the, um, he did the series on Vietnam, Bill tried to get that same series by Ken Burns developed uh, for the Korean War. However, name never came to fruition for whatever reason. But talking to Bill, just to show you, he was a military guy too. He flew F-4C Phantoms. I think that one, the Phantom early on didn't have guns integrated. Or, uh, yeah, had just missiles. But this one had guns on, uh, on one of the stations off the wings. And he flew up the 557 Fighter Squadron, over 140 missions in Vietnam. And he described some of those uh, missions in Vietnam, low level, flying 100 to 200 feet above the ground, um, and using a lot of snake eye bombs and so forth. Uh, he also, at Homestead Air Force, ba Air Force Base in the States, he was telling me he flew an F-4, he took off, all the uh, lights went up on the dash. He had engine, he had, the, the, has two J-79s, you know, on the F-4. So both engines were on fire. He told me he put that thing down in seven and a half minutes, which is, if you're a pilot, are there any pilots in here? Okay, so it, it takes, a, you know, and if you're in an F-4, you have to go wide pattern, and it took him uh, only seven and a half minutes to put it down. He also flew to F-111, F-84, and F-15. Now, let's get off the book. Okay. Sure. Bill McWilliams, what's his real first name? William. He was my flight instructor. Are you? Are you serious? I'll give you his contact information. What, what I'll, oh, you do? That's something else. It's a small world, right? That's, I'd like to have a discussion with you later about that. Because um, I'm really interested in um, uh, aviation history and during the wars, and I'd like to have a talk with you. This is the back of my dad's book. Now, the reason why I started here is because I thought it was powerful uh, for the discussion. One of the things on the back of the book, I want to, you know, somebody looking at the book, is a quote from my dad. During my first battle experience, I was handed a 50 caliber machine gun, even though I trained on 30 caliber Browning. And he said, boy, do you learn fast. Now, I imagine this happened up in Pork Chop Hill. He's up there, and I'll go through the trek and how they made the pork chop. This particular picture is one of my favorites here, and this is expanding out at the end. This is a bunch of um, guys who have all their gear on the ground. I'm not sure if it's for inspection. His dad took that photo. This, this photo here. Yeah. I have a larger format, and this is actually in Korea here. You can see what they call the Kansas line, which was uh, all the hills in the back of him. So he was not far from, I'm not sure how far back from the DMZ. This is just a little bit bigger picture. I had. Okay, so just getting into the beginning, um, 7th Division, 17th Regiment, 2nd Battalion. He was in heavy weapons. Now, heavy weapons encompasses um, mortar platoon, machine gun platoon, and recoilless rifle, those three. So that, that's what um, is within that category. So the other thing I decided to do, let's put together a timeline. You don't see that that often. This was very difficult, and I have all the dates in chronological order when he was inducted. Um, and then uh, when he crossed over into Japan. And I just did this just to show how long he was over there. He was overseas a year and a half. When he left Washington State by boat, he didn't come back for a year and a half. So, um, and uh, now let's continue on here. I decided for family they would want to see the, um, what he got for uh, citations and medals. This particular one here, July 12, the presidential unit citation, um, that one he got for the, the battle of Pork Chop Hill, the second battle. Technically, that ended. The uh, army withdrew from there in, on July 11th. So I'm, I'm figuring he'd get the medal the next day. These are just some other medals a lot of service guys get. 
This is just, I'm gonna go through these quick. The way I, I set up the book is pre-war years, and then during the war years, and post-war years. So this is, um, there's a pointer here. This is my dad right here, Richard, and then his brother, Bob, who went to Korea too. And uh, the mother there, of course. Uh-oh, there we go. So this is where he's brought up in uh, Lawrence, Mass, and uh, West Andover, actually. One thing I want to point out here, he grew up on a farm. He had pigs and all that, so he learned you know, outside activities, and he also had a lot of exercise equipment here. So he was in shape. He played football. He was in shape before he went to Korea. These are just some friends. He's on top of the Empire State Building here. And just his um, high school diploma. These are some of my relatives from um, Can Canada. And they're up there with uh, sickles and so forth. So just a family book you gotta remember. Um, just some pictures growing up. More pictures. Now let's get into the war years. October 16, 1952, Dad uh, gets the call from the Selective Service System to report to Lawrence State Army. Lawrence is in Massachusetts, it's outside, of, outside of Boston. And then, so he was, he was 20 years old at the time, and that's a state armory there. So here's the uh, proverbial um, newspaper picture. <laughs> Unfortunately, my dad is way up here in the back here, <laughs> so you can't see him. I don't know if he did it on purpose. Um, so this is the roster picture taken November 5, 52 in Fort Devens, Mass. So he's, in this picture, he's right here. These are some of the cards he had in his possession, the Selective Service System, Geneva Conventions card, and a Certificate of Service. And I know he carried some of these around with him a lot because in case somebody came up to him, oh, you gotta go back in. Well, I served already. So he carried around in his wallet. So he went over to Indian Town Gap for his training, uh, November 1952. A couple years ago, I was out in this area in Pennsylvania, so I decided to go up. I found this exact building here and took my, my picture here, just like my dad was here. And this is what, 70 years ago. Um, and that's in Hershey. Hershey was nearby Indi Indian Town Gap. Hershey makes all the little chocolates and so forth. That was their area to go for R&R. &R when they're doing training at Indian Town Gap, they popped over to Hershey, which is probably like five or 10 miles away. Here's some more pictures from Indian Town Gap. Now I got up to Indian Town Gap too. They have like a little museum there. If you have any friends or family went there and you're interested in seeing the museum, they have a small museum. And one of the guys from Band of Brothers used to be, um, I can't remember, the main character, or the main soldier in Band of Brothers. I'm trying to remember his, uh, the soldier's name, but he actually signed in here because they had a signature. So he lived nearby in Pennsylvania. It'll come to me later. Dick Winters. Yes, yes, Dick Winters. So he signed in. So here's some more pictures at Indian Town Gap. Just a lot of my dad's friends that he met along the way. This is my dad right here at Indian Town Gap. Uh, my dad's off the upper right hand corner here. Now this picture came out nice and clear, which I like, but. I'm wondering if he actually made up some of the names, like he has MacArthur here. So I'm not sure if those are fictitious or not. You know. Uh, same here. Just a lot of guys went through training with Indian Town Gap. Say again. Ed Sullivan. Yeah, Ed Sullivan. So I think a lot of it was just you know, yeah. So here it is. My dad's wrapping up his training. He's getting ready to go over. Basic training ends ended on March 17th. So don't forget, he's in Pennsylvania. He has to make the train ride across the United States. Um, and he arrives at Fort Lewis in uh, Washington State. Now, my wife and I were just up there recently in the Seattle area because my daughter lives up there. So we got to see Mount Rainier in the background. But this is not far from Seattle, maybe 15, 20 miles south of Seattle. This particular picture here I got off the Internet, and this is representative of the time, you know, during the Korean War. These pictures are difficult to find. If you elected to create a picture book, I tell you, I had to look for a long time to find these pictures. This is the Port of Seattle. Before you left, this is also a representation of around 1950s when uh, the, the boats were leaving to get over to uh, Japan. The name of the ship, I remember my dad said it was Baloo. It's spelled B-O-L-U-E. And um, you know, at this point in time, this is April 17th, 1953. 
Well, ask yourself, when did the second battle of Pork Chop Hill happen? Just a couple months later. So you're going to see how fast uh, he gets into action over there. Of course, everybody gets this crossing uh, the international date line. Um, here we are. We're coming into Yokohama. I guess that's where they make the tires. You know, I remember having Yokohama tires as a kid. And these, these pictures are just stock photos. These are not from my dad. But these are stock photos of a ship coming in and also Camp Drake, where my dad was received. And um, Mount Fuji's pretty close to that area. And he'll be receiving his assignment here at uh, Camp Drake. Then he gets reassigned over to uh, School of Itajima, Japan. Itajima, not Iwo, but Ita, E-T-A. Itajima is in Hiroshima Bay in southwestern uh, Hiroshima. And he said the living conditions were pretty good there. Now, I think this building right here is actually that building there in the picture. I'm not 100% sure. It's hard to put the pieces of the puzzle together sometimes. Now. He gets over to um, Pusan. Now, in a lot of books, you'll see it spelled the B. B-U-S-A-N, it's actually pronounced Pusan. Sometimes you see it spelled P-U-S-A-N. The proper pronunciation is Pusan, of course, but they'll spell it B-U-S-A-N for whatever reason. So this is another picture that is, shows the port area during the time. Now I just decide to take a snapshot because Pusan's way down here. You know, this is uh, South Korea. That black line up there is kind of like where the DMZ is. And the next thing is my dad comes up and he works his way to Chuncheon right here. So that's not far from the DMZ, maybe 15, 20 miles. So initially he was staged there. Okay, wartime efforts, Republic of Korea. And this is that same photo I showed before. This is, I think, one of the best photos um, that he had. Now here's my dad with a 30 caliber water, water cooled machine gun. And, you know, it takes a couple men to operate these things. It's not, when I, when I spoke to um, John Phillips, he was in the mortar platoon, he knew all about how to operate machine guns too because they cross-trained somewhat. So here, here my dad is, he's doing a, um, take, take the machine gun apart. It had um, 53 parts that he had to take apart. Now I'm not sure if that's total parts, number of parts, or just the parts that he had to take apart to clean the gun out for maintenance reasons. Now I remember he said that, the tripod stand was very heavy too. So now you can imagine, if you have to trek this stuff up the pork chop, how much gear, how much this weighs. Now this is turned to be a lightweight machine gun. Your 50 calibers were heavier. So this is a 30 caliber. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm not sure if they had it filled with water. Probably not when they're um, on their trek up the pork chop. But it is a water-cooled gun. Here's another picture, great guns. I'm not sure what this thing is hanging out here. It looks like a brick to me. I don't know if anybody has any ideas, but. Um, now this particular picture here is a little joke between, my dad had a younger brother back in the States and his younger brother, Ronnie, was writing you know, him a, a letter, you know, how are you doing in Korea and all that. And um, the rabbits, they had rabbits, they front, kept them running on, on top of the, uh, the letter. So when my dad got the letter, he joked, he wrote back to my, his brother Ronnie saying, I found the rabbit that was ruining your letter over in Korea, just as a joke. I don't get that. His name was Willie. This is one of my dad's friends. My dad is on the left there, and that's Bill Levesque on the right. Bill Levesque was out in um, Korea at the same time my dad was, and uh, he passed away. My dad's passed away 2009. Bill passed away uh, more recently. But the joke here is, um, is that Bill is holding the shovel. And my dad said, uh, did I tell you I was writing a book called My Shovel is Idle? Now you know why, because my dad doesn't have a shovel in his hand here. Uh, but Bill is interesting. I try to get in touch with, um, I, mean, I figured I'd try to get in touch with Bill's wife. She lives up in Amesbury, Massachusetts. I actually spoke with her. And um, she was supposed to send me a bunch of pictures. I was going to put in the book. I never got the pictures, though. So it's attempts to try to embellish the book, you know, and... Uh, Marilyn Monroe, everybody recognizes her. Well, my dad didn't take this picture. This is a stock photo taken during the Korean War. However, my dad did see her in, in the mess hall. He was in the mess hall, and he said that she was sitting over on the next table over, so no pictures allowed for that reason. Here's some of the money. I actually have this at my, um, 
this money was used from 53, 62, and my dad just brought it back with him, so I don't know <laughs> too much about it. Here's some of the patches he had. Now, these particular patches are, don't, you know, not all of them applied to when he was over there, but um, I know he wore the patch over there. I think that's for the, the red one, it's for the seventh uh, division patch, and then the, um, this particular patch he wore on a uniform too. So this particular picture, I believe it was taken when he was en route between Japan and Korea, that they would use this, uh, it's a C-124 Globemaster II. You know, it has the inverted wing like a Corsair would have it. You can see inverted gull wing. Um, and that's powered by four R4, uh, forty-three sixty Pratt Whitney engines. Well, when my dad got out of the war, he happened to start working for Pratt Whitney. So I think seeing all these military, military aircraft over there had an influence on him on what he decided to do after the war, too. Here's my dad. He has an MP helmet on. Now, I'm not sure if he was actually an MP or just fooling around here, but I thought it was uh, a great picture of him. This particular picture here, John Phillips, who was in a mortar platoon, explained this picture to me. Up front here, you have a 30 caliber um, water-cooled machine gun, like my dad used. This, he thought, was a captured Chinese gun that they captured. This is after the war now, and they, they captured the gun. And uh, because it, you can see how old it looks, first of all. The other thing is, notice some of the things in the background. There's a stretcher here. So he thought that a medic could have been um, sleeping in one of these bunks here because of this, this stretcher here. So here's my dad on the left with the, uh, what's the term on the, on the big tanks, the buffalo? There's a name for those, the, uh, the water tanks. Is a, there's a slang name for them. But anyways, he's mentioned in the background the skyline of, um, of the Kansas line, the 38th parallel up there. They refer to the Kansas line. In this picture, particular picture, I'm not sure what kind of rifle he's holding there, but um, I'm thinking that might have been taken back in Pennsylvania. There's so many trees out there. There's another picture of my dad on the left. This is a double exposure picture. I'm not sure who this individual is on the left here. Um, now, these pictures he was taken up near Porkchop Hill. In my estimation, this is just south of Porkchop, maybe about a mile, mile and a half, maybe two miles at the most. There were specific hills named after the um, elevation of the hills, like Hill 347, Hill 200, and Porkchop Hill had its own designated number two. But you can see he's standing on top of a bunker right here. It's all camouflaged. And here you can see um, part of the machine gun here. And someday I'll figure out what hills are, are actually behind him there. Now he's pointing out with the arrow there. That could be pork chop. I'm not actu actually sure. This looks similar to the other photo we just saw. We can see somebody else's foot in the foreground here. So the Battle of Porkchop Hill, um, there were two major battles of Porkchop. First one was in the spring of 1953. The second one was in July 1953 when my dad was there. So well, I'm trying to give you a depiction of um, down here is Hill 347 where they um, were gathered. And in future, in other slides, you'll see they make their way up by taking the route of going up Hill 200 at the peak of the hill because altitude is your friend. Having high ground in the army means you're not getting bombed from down, you know, if you're down below in the valley. So they did take a, uh, the trek on top of this hill, and there's pork chop right there. They had to come down through the valley there. I'll explain later. They got bombed with mortars while they're transitioning two hills here. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the uh, command bunkers were right about here on pork chop hill. This is the enemies from here to the left, and the United States is to the right. And other nations, too, of course, fought, fought in pork chop. Okay, these are two stock photos. It's very difficult to find photos um, to do with pork chop. But the one on the left is stock photo. The one on the right shows what trench warfare is all about. When you were up there, according to what I read, and my dad told me, you're in the trenches all the time. Everybody's in the trenches. Otherwise, he was in, uh, in July, it was the worst possible time to be a pork chop hill. That was, um, they were trying to gain ground as their negotiations uh, for peace, but um, the, the hill had no mil military value at all. 
you know, except for you're gaining ground. So you can see with the trenches, you're constantly traversing those trenches. So this particular picture is very important. This is my dad. He's got the f adorned in a flak jacket, a couple of hand grenades, and he's ready to go. Well, talking to John Phillips, who was in the same company as my dad from in the uh, mortar platoon, and my dad was in the machine gun platoon, he knew the exact date of this. This is July 7th, 1953, uh, just at the start of his trip up to pork chop. Um, so a couple things I want to mention here. Um, my dad at some point was in a truck or a Jeep and um, the Jeep got either in an accident or hit by something. He got thrown out of the Jeep into some bushes. Well, he got slightly injured with that. Um, anyway, my dad's commander, Raymond Clark. These, now the reason why I have all these bullets is I gathered these from the exchanges I had in letters with John Phillips, who's in Howe Company, Mortar Platoon, and Raymond Clark, who, this is the gentleman my dad reported to. This is the, he's the machine gun platoon leader for Howe Company, 7th Regiment, 7th Division. Raymond Clark, I think, is the reason that none of the guys underneath them, they had 50 men in the mission, in a machine gun platoon, none of them got killed. And it, it was pretty bad up there. One guy got injured, but uh, I think the reason why my dad did so well over there is because of this gentleman. He, had, he served in World War II, he's in Guadalcanal. Uh, he was in Korea and also Vietnam later. So the time frame now is pretty compressed. We're talking July 7th through 10th, so inclusively, what's that, four days? Four days they um, completed the uh, pork chop hill trip. I'll go through more of that. Some of the decorations that Raymond Clark had, he had two Purple Hearts, Silver Star, four Bronze Stars, uh, two for, in Vietnam, and one uh, in World War II in Korea. And he had all these different um, service medals, which was you know, between three different wars. wars. So he served in World War II, Korean War, and Vietnam. Let's continue on here. Some more recollections from Raymond Clark's letters that I have in my possession. So, um, the Howe Company consists of a mortar platoon, 81 millimeter, machine gun platoon, 30 caliber, and recoilless rifle platoon, 75 millimeter. Um, the Howe Company that they took up for this mission was the platoon, the machine gun platoon consisted of 50 men. Uh, due to circumstances, Raymond Clark mentioned there was no support from rifle squads because you, ordinarily you have reliance on rifle squads keeping you safe. Um, so what Raymond mentioned here, on July 7th, they're all gearing up, getting ready to go to pork chop. Each man, according to the job, is equipped with either M1 rifle carbine, assault machine gun, plus a 45 caliber pistol, ammo belts, helmet, flak jacket, hand grenades, canteen, first aid packet, poncho, ri rifle grenade launcher, and grenades and bayonet. So at this point in time, um, they're loading up on an APC carrier truck, and uh, over here, this is the map that Raymond Clark uh, drew out. I don't want to block the camera, because this map here, you won't find any books at all. Raymond Clark drew this out for John Phillips and Howe Company, explaining his recollection tw uh, 20 or 30 years after uh, the Korean War. So this, here's Pork Chop up here. And uh, you know, uh, the name serves its, the shape serves its purpose. Down here, you had Hill 347, which my dad was up on. Also, John Phillips was at. And uh, it's a major line of resistance. This was your major line of resistance. So you have a lot, of, a lot of power here to stop the enemy. Then they had rifle uh, squads and machine gun squads go up and try to you know, fight the battle of pork chop. These, but this was the major line of resistance right here. So on, on July 7th, they start out by packing up all the gear. That's position one here. Day two, which was July 8th, they're in this position. Then they took an APC truck up to position three here. Uh, now after position three, which is actually day three, July 9th, they had communication to go up to Pork Chop to meet uh, Commander Noble. So this, this particular tr uh, trek here was not by truck. This is a walk with all that equipment I just uh, I told you about the machine guns and so forth. So they departed from here, went up on the top ridge of Hill 200 to gain the altitude um, and you get advantage. When they came down to this position here, they got shelled 
by mortar, they got mortars, mortar uh, shells were coming over. And my dad said especially, told me many times, the Chinese were very good at, at trajectory firing of shells. Um, and then position four is where they met up with um, Noble, who was the commander. Uh, let me just go to the next screen here. Okay, now, what's the conditions? They did all this in 100 degree heat and high humidity. And um, so as I said, they proceeded down Hill 200, which is in the upper right-hand corner, and they got shelled, they got shelled there. Um, then they met up with Major Noble up at Pork Chop at position four right here. They met up with Noble here. And um, so Noble inst instructed the entire machine gun squad to um, fire, they wanted to fire on the upper slope of Pork Chop uh, because there were two machine gun squads, you know, Chinese machine gun squads up there. So my dad's outfit took out two automatic, um, two of the enemy's automatic firing weapons. And they, the enemy had the advantage. They were on top of the hill. They were shooting down. So you have an advantage for that reason. Um, so Raymond Clark's recollection, he said, pork chop at the time was a never ending inferno of explosions in, from Chinese and US weapons. Um, among them were Chinese rifles, machine guns, grenades, mortars, rockets, artillery, 30 caliber rifles, machine guns, 50 caliber machine guns, 3.5 inch rocket launchers, twin 40 mm millimeter AA guns, 57. You can read the whole um, amount of what they were using over there. All movements on pork chop were done at your own peril. They were hugging the ground in trenches all the time. Chinese and Americans occupied the same trenches only a few feet apart, can you imagine that? Um, impossible to determine where the front lines were. It's typical. Many soldiers were no longer had leaders. And this is all from Raymond Clark's uh, recollection. And they were trying to survive were wounded or worn out by hunger and lack of water. There's no water up there. I mean, <laughs> unless there's a nearby stream and use those special filtration pumps, I doubt it. So here's, this is a different picture now. Now we got a close up of Park Chop Pill. What Raymond's trying to describe here are, uh, for instance, Major Noble, who they had get in touch with, is his command bunker is right here. The child bunker was here, and that also acted as a first aid st uh, station. It's the summit of the hill. A second aid station was here, and then a the ammo, ammunition storage bunker was right here. The other thing I want to point out here is uh, this, these arrows are the roads used by the APCs. You can see the, by the trucks bringing the troops in. Now, my dad didn't come in this way by truck. He came on Hill 200 over this way. But other people, like the rifle squads, came in by APCs. This is one direction. Drop off the guys, jump out of the truck, and you, you get the heck out of there, right? Uh, communications was very limited. They had a lot of trouble reading um, the book on hollow ground. They had a lot of trouble communicating because if you're going to um, transmit over the airways, they didn't have encryption back then. So you're just going to be talking to the enemy. And um, so the area in shade here is, is the Chinese. This direction and our forces, the UN forces are on this side. And uh, so the other thing that um, Raymond Clark noted, he watched when he got up and observed. He went up by himself on the hill uh, just to see how things were. He observed two rifle companies, uh, Company I and Company K, commence attack. So he watched this all in progress with you know, binoculars. And both of those rifle squads, according to him, got wiped out. Now, you know, it, it was a tough time out there. Um, but Major uh, Raymond Clark actually got hit twice, injured by 60 millimeter mortars as well as several of the platoon members. Well, like I said before, they didn't lose anybody, nobody KIA. KIA. Um, so Noble, who was the commander, uh, gave instruction to Raymond Clark's group to resupply troops on the hill. The rifle squads, for instance, those guys are desperate, need everything. You know, ammunition mostly, water, those kind of things. So they're instructed to go up and resupply them, treat and evacuate the wounded uh, to be loaded up on the APC to be taken back. Um, so one, in one instance, one of the ammo boxes, a box of ammo caught on fire. And as you know, that's a big danger. The outside of the box caught on fire. So um, Noble instructed them, some of the soldiers pick up the box and throw it off a cliff. Well, a couple of these guys 
going over to do that, they were uh, knocked off their feet by, you know, mortars from the enemy. Um, so at nighttime, what did they do at nighttime? My dad mentioned to me, he was down inside of a bunker, a trench, and a Chinese were running over his trench at nighttime. And he said a kid next to him, he said a kid, maybe he was 18 years old, was, had a pistol and taken pot shots of these, you know, Chinese going over him. So um, the other thing is my dad did help out some of the doctors there, held candle uh, so the doctor can see while he's doing his operating. They captured two enemy prisoners. Um, and then finally they were uh, relieved from pork chop on July 10th. So that was a four day stint to go all the way up there. They did o overnight one night, July 9th into the 10th and they get relieved. Well, my dad was one of the last people on Pork Chop, because you can see the army was relieved, relieved on July 10th by, uh, I'm sorry, the army was relieved by July 11th. My dad left on the day before July 10th. So he was, you know, one of the last people up there. Let's continue on here. So, you know, right after that, so this has all happened in the middle of July 1953. On July 27th, the armistice was signed. And, um, you know, so my dad wasn't over there for a long time in battle. However, he was over there in the worst possible time. Um, so my dad mentioned to me one of the most distressing parts of pork, being in Pork Chop Hill Veteran is not knowing where your friends went after. Everybody was dispersed. You know, you lose a lot of people. Either they get separated. One thing he didn't mention, coming off the lines after being up for three days, he came back and they told him, put your pup, you know, you can put up your tents, and uh, you know, it was pouring rain out, it was monsoon rains, and they elected just to sleep in the mud. They were totally, totally exhausted, and that's what they did. Um, actually, my dad saw the movie Platoon, he said that was probably the closest he ever seen to real battle before as far as, you know, movies made. Well, they made a movie of Portshop Hill also. Yeah. What does your dad think of that? How accurate? Um, he didn't say it. He watched that movie. Gregory Peck's in that yeah, movie. Right. He watched that movie, but I don't remember saying if it's accurate or not. Maybe it was. I don't know if there's any formed opinion. He never told me what his opinion was on that movie, but he did watch it, though. That, that's an interesting question, though, because I, I always wonder about that myself. So here's my dad. When they signed the armistice, this was taken on the same day they signed it. The word gets out. And imagine the relief now. Here he is holding, I think that is, I think that's a 50 caliber. Can anybody see if that's a 50? Yeah. And here he says, as a reason to smile, they signed the armistice that morning. This is the back side of the picture. Okay, so uh, that was in July of 1953. The war is over for him. He's got to stay in the area for another year and serve and get, you know, point system, whatever. He doesn't leave. Korea to another year after that. Uh, he left in August of 54, but up here he arrives in November 53, Camp Jocelyn, which is in Yubon, Korea, and they're northeast of Seoul. So I can tell you that this picture was very difficult to find. This is the only picture I found on the internet regarding Camp Jocelyn. So here, uh, December 24, 53, um, he he graduated from a non-commissioned officer's academy at Camp Jocelyn under the command of Major Brian. So this is the actual certificate. Now this is, you know, they're still over in Korea and they're having their, what they call 3.2% beer. They didn't have beer like they did these days, apparently. Everything is low alcohol. But that's my dad in the middle in the left picture. Also they had R&R &R in Japan. So they, my dad mentioned the hot tubs. You go over there and uh, that guy, Bill Levesque, was with uh, my dad. He started using the soap in the hot tub. They got super mad at him, the people that run in the facility. You're not you're supposed to use soap in those hot tubs, you know. <laughs> um, so this is the boat on the way back, August 2. Notice the date. August 2, 54. He was out there for a full year after um, they signed the armistice. He left uh, Pusan, Korea, on the boat USS Hope. That is the same boat. Um, one of the things they did on the boat is said, you know, now here it is, we're gonna have an inspection because I wanna make sure that people aren't carrying stuff in their duffel bags. And all of a sudden, you see stuff going overboard. They were throwing, a lot of guys were throwing stuff out. My dad left a hand grenade. It's an inert, all the gunpowder's out. He left a hand grenade at the bottom of his duffel bag. He brought that back. As a, as a kid, we always had the hand grenade in the house with the pin on it, you know. 
Uh, he brought back his army boots and so forth. So he arrives in, after a year and a half being over there, he arrives into uh, the port of Seattle. This is a representative picture of what Seattle looked like back in the 50s. And one of the things, they went to a bar to celebrate. He goes to the bartender, you see all those list of drinks there? I want every single one of those served to me and my buddy. So they went through the whole list. <laughs> no questions, right? So now, um, from Seattle, he took a four-day train ride back to Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. And I think that's a, now a college area, Camp Kilmer in New Jersey. That's where he was, uh, uh, he got his honorable separation. He got paid $300. I don't know if the $300 is for six months work, one month, I don't know, maybe you guys know what you would get $300. Well, that's what he got when he left. So altogether, my dad served 654 days in the Army. Um, age, now, now he's age 22 back in the States. What are you going to do? It's, you know, he didn't have time to go to college or anything, so uh, you have to figure out what you're going to do. Here he is here. He's uh, back in the States. You can see he's in relatively good shape. Um, but uh, I think that a lot of the military gear over in Korea had an impact on his influence on what he decided to do with his career path. So what he decided to do uh, these are just family pictures when they got back, and this is one for Connecticut. Um, that's my dad there. He's got his, um, the gun of the battle wreath on it. Um, those are the two brothers. My dad's on the right there, on the left-hand picture, and my Uncle Bob on the left. As I say, my Uncle Bob was there before my dad fought on Heartbreak Ridge in Old Baldy. This is just some other fellow in the service with him here. And again, this is for family consumption. It's kind of like, why are you showing me these pictures? This is what I have. Uh, one of the things my dad liked to mention to me all the time is like, notice how he stuffed his pants into the boots. That was supposed to be a classy thing to do, probably a must when you're in the army. But um, uh, this is, they visited some place up in uh, Massachusetts that had um, these, uh, these guns. This was after the war. So what does a fellow do after he gets out of war? You meet your wife, right? So four months later, he met my wife through common friends. Your mother. <laughs> my mother, well. thank you. I, I want to see if anybody catch me on that one. Wait a minute, she's listening, she's listening. So that's my mother on the right, that's my dad on the left. They met, and um, my dad was into cars. This is a uh, sorted uh, cars that he had, and this is their wedding. They got married in 1956. And I'm actually in the middle of that picture right there, my two other brothers. One of the things my dad started rubbing off on us kids, we had, he had three sons, I'm one of his sons. He started taking it to a lot of air shows. I think a lot of that had to do with seeing all these planes fly, like Corsairs, for instance. He's seen Corsairs over in Korea doing strafing runs. And that started rubbing off on his kids. He made many, many models of airplanes and so forth. So here he is, my dad here with us kids. Years later, two of his sons would become pilots. So myself, which is right here, and my brother Rick became pilots. We flew out of the same airport here in Meriden, Connecticut to, to get our uh, pilot's license. This particular picture is interesting. Anybody know what kind of jets those are in the background? Those are F-100s. They'll serve in Korea, uh, I mean in um, Vietnam mostly. Uh, my wife's uncle, Rusty, flew to F-100 too, flew to F-100A. Uh, which was the better model of the F-100, if I'm understanding. But this picture was taken up by Bradley Airfield, which is uh, Windsor Locks, Connecticut, about 1965, and that's with the Thunderbirds. Um, so my dad ended up working at Pratt Whitney Aircraft, and he started like in the late 50s working Pratt Whitney Aircraft. Um, and this is an open house during the 70s. He worked uh, over 30 years at Pratt Whitney, and this is him at the open house in the 70s. Now, some of the things Pratt Whitney was doing is showing off the F-15, for instance. So, because Pratt Whitney in East Hartford had an um, airstrip called Rentschler Field, and he said periodically they'd have a test pilot come in, like from flying an F-15, gonna test new version of, a, of an engine, clear the airspace to 30,000 feet, so he got to see the aircraft go full afterburner and do a full vertical climb up to 30,000 feet. So this is some of the things, reasons why you like working for Pratt. Uh, a lot of excitement. You see what you build in action. Uh, so he got an honorable discharge in 1960. So this is him later in life than during the 70s. Still taking us to air shows. 
Here's us kids here. It's an F-101 in the background. Down here, my brother and I, my brother here worked at one of the airports that uh, I flew out of, and he's strapping my dad into a BT-13. The manager of the airport had a BT-13, it's a Volte. There's not many flying in the world. At the time, there was only 10 BT-13s flying in the world. And I got to fly in that later, a little stick time. It's, it's a slow aircraft. Um, but uh, that was an exciting time for him. This is just later on in life now. This is my dad here and my uncle. Both were in Korea. Uh, this is about my uncle, one, one page dedicated to him. However, my cousin has a book completely dedicated to him. He was in the, the Korean War, 1951 to 53. This is my uncle Bob right here that I'm speaking of. And this is my dad. Uh, so he's at the Battle of Old Baldy and Battle of Heartbreak Ridge. He had two bronze stars and um, he had specialty training with the Wire Communication School. He also worked at uh, Pratt Whitney, so my dad saw him up there, but he had a very unique job at Pratt Whitney Aircraft. There's a test facility um, east of the airfield up in East Hartford called Will Goose, and they would have the engine, say a J79 on a test stand, running up full power, throw a bunch of birds into the fan while it's running 80,000 RPM, and see what happens to the, the engine. Well, that. There, were, there weren't many people had that job, and he was one of the uh, engine testers there, my Uncle Bob. This picture here was taken to Korea during the cold, probably over the winter, you can see the heavy jackets they're wearing. So my dad was laid to rest in 2009. He got buried up in uh, Lawrence, Mass. And the best thing I, about it was they had military honors for him because we were deciding, should, you know, my mother, you know, <laughs> It was, it was a discussion, let's put it that way. But we decided to do the military honors, which I'm, I'm grateful for. And uh, some other things, um, some guys from work got this uh, dedication brick on the upper left-hand corner, U.S. Army. Um, and after he passed, he got a presidential memorial uh, certificate. And we got the Korean War Memorial coin here for him. And that's his obituary. Um, now, he also got a... a our certificate at the time was President Obama and also from the state of Connecticut a memorial certificate. Now I just wrote here, this is again designed for the family, so I just expressed my reason for writing a book. One thing I want to point out though is that <clears throat> I think he was very thankful to make it out of Korean War alive, including his, own, um, his brother, in that you know he appreciated life a lot more because of that. <coughs> Um, this is him, probably, I don't know, uh, early 70s here. Now, I found this poem by Francis Macy, and if you look that up online, I think that uh, you, can, you can get copies of that. But that's a, I thought that poem was very nice uh, to do with Korea, because it really has to do with Korea was the forgotten war. And um, at the bottom, he says, we grow f fewer of the years now and still didn't raise a fuss, but Korea really happened, so please remember us. I mean, it's, it's very appropriate, I think. So um, these particular pieces of paper on the left, my mother found while I was researching a book. She's looking at going through old picture books, and she pulled out a picture. Behind the picture are these three little pieces of paper. They're about this big, that my dad wrote all the dates down where he was. That's how I know. In the timeline in the beginning, I showed you the timeline. Um, he has all the dates down where he was and so forth. So that's just the back of the book. One thing I want to show you here, just to summarize, the trek. And now, I did this with Google Earth, uh, Google Maps. You can do this. If you're trying to present a book, you can take snapshots and embellish it here. So Fort Devens, Indian Town Gap, out to Fort Lewis, and then the boat to Japan. Over here, it gets a little bit more complicated, right? It gets received in uh, Yokohama, and then uh, to a couple different locations here, and then out to uh, Pusan here. This gives you a good depiction of South Korea. Pusan, up to uh, Seoul and Chuncheon, and then fought in the battle, came back to 17th headquarters, and then he went uh, for R&R &R over to Tokyo, and then back again. Then he got uh, released a year later. So this is the trek on the way back, coming in by boat to Seattle, and to get released around the Philadelphia area. Now, visiting the DMZ, has every, anyone ever been to uh, South Korea before? Yeah. So my daughter's boyfriend 
was up there about 20 years ago, from some kind of internship through a school. He sent me these pictures recently, said, I've been up there. You can go up and visit the DMZ. Uh, this is him right here, Alex. And uh, it must be his friend, but um, one thing I want to point out here is on the right side, you get the world's largest flagpole is, and guess where it is? It's in North Korea. He took a picture of it right there on the right. And they have very, uh, various monuments up there. And uh, just to summarize, you know, with Douglas MacArthur, the soldier above all people prays for peace, for he must bear the scars and deepest wounds of war. Now this particular picture, I had in black and white up until about a month ago, because some guy on the um, Korean War Project, which is a Facebook, uh, has Facebook presence, took my dad's picture in black and white and colorized it. So this is the colorized version of it here. Finally, I want to thank everybody for coming and thanks for your service. Appreciate it. Michael, you able to take a few questions? Sure, you some from sure, the try to end right at questions 11. Impressive uh, assortment of pictures well, and the, that effort you, there's a, you had to go through. That's terrific. There's a lot of slides, and yeah. I just try to keep focused. The, yeah. the major thing I want to sh is with Raymond Clark providing all those maps right. was phenomenal right. because I didn't know, I didn't have all that detail yeah. until I got that recently. Well, I mean, the fact that Pork Chop Hill looked like a pork chop was uh, yeah. <laughs> exactly. uh, yeah. was good. And anyway, on behalf of the museum, here's a challenge coin well, thanks, for you. Thanks for, so much. I really appreciate it. Uh, present your presentation. Oh, thank you. And uh, we'll be, uh, I think we're here again uh, next week. Are we here next week? Yes. Yeah, yeah. we've got one next week. Uh, that's with, uh, that's the, uh, uh, I think the, 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 the love letters.